else. It is not if the forest will burn, it'll be when the forest will burn. It's a fact. Forests burn. In Canada, forests burn regardless of human presence. Ecological research has revealed there is a natural rhythm to the cycle of forest fires. We have built our towns, cities, industries, roads and critical infrastructure in the midst of the forest. We are in the path of a natural destructive cycle. In the face of our changing climate, these cycles are being affected in ways we don't yet understand. We need to prepare our communities as best we can. Forest researchers and scientists, including governments, industry and universities, are working with vulnerable communities to find solutions and develop strategies. When a forest burns, an immense amount of energy is released. Uncontrolled, this energy has enormous destructive potential. In 2018, fires in British Columbia released enough energy to power all of Canada for an entire year. Can human ingenuity adapt to this natural fire cycle and redirect this enormous energy potential to constructive ends? FP Innovations, a not-for-profit forest research company, has been studying this proposition. The forest will burn will look into a bold and innovative new strategy to both mitigate the destructive power of forest fires while at the same time harnessing the energy for constructive purposes. In British Columbia, the entire land base has been classified into broad ecosystems called biogeoclimatic zones. The land base has also been classified by the normal cycles of natural disturbance that occur in each area. For example, much of interior BC is classified as Natural Disturbance Type 3, or NDT3. In the ecosystems of NDT3, the natural disturbance pattern is called Frequent Stand Initiating Events. These events typically occur every 100 to 125 years. The disturbance is almost always fire, or perhaps a widespread mountain pine beetle outbreak, which might be followed a few years later by fire. A stand initiating fire destroys nearly all the trees and resets the natural conditions for the stand to replace itself. My name is Charles Friesen. I'm a senior researcher at FP Innovations, focusing on biomass and fiber supply. In this video, we are going to visit three remote First Nations communities in British Columbia. Each of these communities is off-grid, which means that they are not connected to either the electrical infrastructure grid or the natural gas grid. They are also surrounded by forest, and are threatened by forest fires because of the natural disturbance patterns in their ecosystems. We begin our journey with the tiny community of Kluskas. It almost looked like a tornado and uh, the wind goes so strong and all the tree all bent down. It's so dry and it burns so fast, really dry. We're pretty, we was pretty sure we lost this reserve too that time. Amelia Couples, and I'm Truska's Union. I'm Truska's elder. I feel, I'm scared that time. I'm scared about a lot of things, birds and all our animals protecting them. Nobody protect them and just burn up, I guess. We make medicine and then we pick in berries and that same place wherever we go there all 
it's all burned down, there's nothing left, so. Also make me cry because I feel so bad. That last fire, the ones up that way made it pretty dark and you could see those hot embers coming down there. They had a clinic down there before, then everybody went up down there so they wouldn't burn up in the night. Well, in terms of the, the size of the fire, uh, 520,000 hectares is really hard to imagine, but when you get up into the air and you're able to look, you can see that the fire where it burned from our community, you can fly about an hour and a half to Williams Lake. Well, my name is Neil Guthrow. I work for the Luskas Dene Nation. We're currently standing in one of our fuel treatment zones on Kluskis IR-1. Well, we've had a number of wildfires go through our area over the last, geez, 12 years. We've been evacuated five times within that. Uh, we had an assessment done to see what the fuel rating was within our area. And, and within this particular area, we had uh, a very high rating of uh, fuels that, had they lit, would go right into the community. Well, we had a RPF come in, a registered professional forester come in and do a treatment for it to take a look to see what types of fuels we had out on the land. We've had mountain pine beetle come through the area here, so we've got a, a whole lot of dead standing trees, or had a lot of dead standing trees, I should say, with uh, different types of ladder fuels that should the fire start on the ground, it would quickly spread to the trees and into the crowns. Uh, and in doing so, we had to have someone come in and remove approximately 10 hectares or 2,000 meters cubed of dead and dying timber to help reduce the overall wildfire rating. Well, all the wood that we've taken off this site will be used uh, uh, for community firewood. It can be used for construction wood. We can do uh, a number of things other than sell it. So what we're looking at is potentially using it uh, as fuel and chip for uh, a potential combined heat and power uh, source. Well, we've, we're going to be bringing on this combined heat and power source to uh, reduce or hopefully eliminate our reliance on our generators and the diesel fuel that we've been burning will decrease our carbon footprint. Generator powers the whole town. It burns like 200 liters in 24 hours, I think. These kind of systems provide an ideal solution because we are producing uh, energy locally. We're not used burning oil or, or natural gas that, that has to be imported from somewhere else. Uh, right now we're at the National Research Council in, in Vancouver at their site uh, where we together with UBC and FP Innovations half build a, a test site for small-scale combined heat and power systems uh, where we can de-risk test them and bring people here to showcase the technology and also train them. So de-risking entails putting these systems through extreme conditions so, um, and, and then seeing what the response of uh, the unit is. It's pretty much like uh, test driving a car. The chips are extracted go through a number of conveyors, usually the fines are uh, removed and then are fed into the gasifier itself um, where they're then gasified so it produces a, a syngas uh, which is then fed into a internal combustion engine which produces electricity over a generator and also waste heat which that waste heat we use again uh, to dry those wood chips and as well heat buildings in the community. Uh, we're now standing in front of the uh, CHP uh, Combined Heat and Power Unit. This particular one is from Finland. Uh, the company is called Walter, uh, and it's enclosed in a 40-foot sea can, which makes it ideal for transportation 
Um, it's basically all enclosed in one container, um, which includes uh, the reactor itself, gas cleaning, as well as the engine and generator set. Uh, so if this thing arrives on site, all you need to do is you hook up your electricity and your heat connections and you're more or less good to go. And we are replacing fossil fuels, we're doing something to combat climate change. And we're also making sure that communities are safe from, from fires. Next, we visit the community of Alkali Lake. It is a natural disturbance type 4, which is called frequent stand maintaining fires. Past forest management and fire suppression practices have led to a buildup of surface biomass called ladder fuels in the forest understory. The people of Alkali Lake have undertaken their own forest management activities that reflect more historically natural ecosystem conditions. The forest will burn. Kulikinu in Squest, Camelton Elia, Samuel H. Madston, Urban Johnson. I'm one of the hereditary chiefs here at Esket. You're, you're, what you're standing on here is, is the center of the people of the White Earth, uh, the Esketum community. Uh, the focus of my f program is restoring the fire maintained ecosystems, which are the natural disturbance type 4. So that's a low severity, frequent uh, f stand maintaining fires that would move through these ecosystems. Everything evolves in these forests around succession. So um, fire is the main disturbance, uh, including insects and, p and pathogens. But, and so w what happens um, is if you exclude fire, is that succession starts taking place in amongst the veteran trees. And you have multiple layers that start building up and start um, making that forest into a denser stand. Normally, uh, the practice of the people, like of our ancestors, they controlled a lot of the uh, fuels in the forest. Uh, they did a lot of burning. This treatment here is one of our fuel treatments that are within um, three kilometers from Alcala Lake. My name is Darren Stanislaus. I am the area supervisor for Alcala Resource Management. So for what you see on the left, if we had a, a wildfire come through with the amount of fuel that we have with the dead branches going up the, the trees and the fuel with the lower brush on the ground, if a fire were to come in here, it has a greater chance of getting into the, the crown and then we have no control over it. But with the fire on, if in our treated side, if the fire is coming in on the ground, it's with the less fuel load, it's not going to burn as intense as the untreated side. And if we ever do get into the crown because of the spacing density we have, there's very low, low, low risk of it traveling as high and intense and as fast as the untreated side. At this site, we are doing a fuel treatment hazard reduction and it's a primary fuel break. And at the same time we're using the fuel to help supply the biomass plant within our community. We are standing here in front of our biomass project that was started about eight years ago. It is a heat a heating system that we have piped into the ground. It's about a four million dollar system that we hope it's going to pay for itself in, in the next four to ten years. 
Uh, over the years, what has happened is uh, we're finding that we're paying more into propane, into heating our buildings and they're here in our community, our elder center, our, our health center, our band office, our school, um, and the store. And it also uh, blazes a trail for other First Nations that they can come here. And a number of First Nations have come and looked at the plant and they're, they're thinking, oh, hey, we can do this in my community. The people of Alkali Lake have used a thinning fire smart treatment to reduce their risk in NDT4. Next, we visit the Kodacha Nation at Fort Ware. We're in a very heavily forested area. Uh, surrounded by uh, spruce, uh, aspen, balsam, lots of dead pine because of the pine beetle. And uh, yeah, so very, very high risk with uh, a fire. It's a, it's a situation where it's a, a matter of not if, but when there's going to be a big fire. You look at the fires nowadays, they're not, they're not just a forest fire, they're fire storms. Because of this threat of fire, a treatment regime was recommended. It is appropriate where a natural disturbance pattern of stand initiating fires, or crown fires, occurs every 100 to 125 years. The idea is for hazard reduction rings to imitate this natural disturbance frequency and provide biomass to produce energy in a power plant. The community is at the center of the rings. Each ring is two kilometers wide. This is wide enough to reduce the chance of a catastrophic fire and improve detection and suppression. The interface zone can use a special type of fire smart treatment that involves thinning and pruning the stand like we saw in Alkali Lake. The inner ring is cut over the course of 12 years it is divided into 12 equal sections, and one section is cut each year. Each year's harvest is replanted after cutting, so that supply is continual, and the forest always grows back to support local plant and animal species. The inner ring is cut first to immediately reduce the hazard for the town. The first area cut in each ring is in the direction of the prevailing winds. The next ring to be cut is the outer ring, over 40 years, in order to reduce risk to the growing stock. Then the next outermost ring is cut, then the final ring is cut. Once a section is cut, it will provide significant resistance to fire development until age 20 and good resistance to fire till age 40. Meaning a four kilometer width of land is reducing the chance of catastrophic fire because the regrowing trees are small and have widely spaced crowns. Once the last ring is cut after 100 years, the first ring will be ready for cutting again. This is the system that was recommended in Fort Ware. A combined heat and power biomass plant has been in operation in Fort Ware for three and a half years. Uh, the biomass system, the changes that it's made is, is nothing but positivity. Uh, we're creation, it, even in the future, if it doesn't make us a whole bunch of money, it's gonna be energy for the people here at home, we're creation and just just uh, self-sustainability. That's what Kodachi Nation is all about. We don't want to have to ask for too much. We want to create things to make sure that we are our own bosses here. My name is Eric Hawking. I'm a Community Works Manager here at Kodachi Nation, Fort Ware, BC. So I run the maintenance department, the housing department, and I overlook the biomass and greenhouse system. Basically, the biomass right now feeds uh, electricity back into the grid 
meeting us with BC Hydro. Eventually into the future, we may want to push the biomass project and get more, more energy back to the grid. So the, the biomass system themselves in an Aboriginal nation creates a lot of windows for separate trades to be trained and yeah, a lot of, lot of employment opportunity when it comes to the chips, the harvesting of the wood from the field. There's a lot of jobs around these biomass systems for, for nations. And it's an exciting thing because these are the jobs that community members love. You know, working with the wood, going out there, you know, even with the chipper plant for the bioenergy, people love that kind of work. And our sawmill is great because there's a little bit of value added. We, we mill the timber here for our own, our own uses and, and also, well, to build the bridge mods and to supply board and batten for the homes in the community. And it provides jobs, local jobs. It employs about half a dozen guys. Well, the biomass system is put, up, put together just to, to basically take our beetle killed wood. We do woodlot cutting for most of the beetle killed wood, which is also fire prevention within the nation. Also the, uh, the extras from our mill project itself. Uh, we produce uh, heat and power through these machines. The engine alone is cooled by, it's, it doesn't use antifreeze, it uses water coolant. And uh, we ship all that glycol and plus water to the school and to the greenhouse. Our heating system for the school is, it, it, when it was designed, was uh, propane, off of propane boilers. And now, because of our bioenergy plant, we uh, supplement the propane with the uh, bio plant. Some of the residual effects of the plant, like the greenhouse, provides lots of educational opportunities with the production of uh, fresh uh, vegetables. I get heat from uh, biomass from next door. That's a wood waste facility. Gives me through the air here. And then I have propane burners here as well. So I'm Ruud Graat, I'm the head grower in the greenhouses here at Fort Warren for the Quadratia Nation. In this greenhouse we're growing tomatoes, three kinds, uh, TUVs, tomatoes on the vine, beefsteak and cherry tomatoes, and I have a bit of melons in here as well. And then there is another greenhouse with uh, cucumbers and peppers and with a bit of a propagation area for starting. And then there's a third greenhouse where I have some cola crops, like beans, corn is in there right now, and some carrots, and so on. Uh, success in the, as in producing, it's producing enough for the whole community. I'm looking into some markets, or we are looking into some markets, neighboring community and some camps around, maybe a mine next year as well. Just Otherwise, I'm producing way too much for the population here, that's, that's, that's for sure. I can get it off real fresh as well, which makes it taste better, because of the shorter channel. Right? It goes from here to the couple hundred meters and it's at, at its destination, so I can pick it way riper than what you buy in the shop, so it's actually nicer too. It can be done at other locations, definitely. I think if we continue along the path of economic development and, and uh, keep all the work in between the two communities that are up here, you know, moving forward, I think uh, we can create quite an economic empire here. For communities in the forest, the threat of fire and destruction looms. But with proper planning that imitates natural disturbance, the threat can be controlled, and the power of fire can bring opportunity, jobs, independence, energy, and food.